Barry's father had been bred, like many other young sons of a genteel family, to the profession of the law. And there is no doubt he would have made an eminent figure in his profession had he not been killed in a duel, which arose over the purchase of some horses. Based upon the 1844 novel, The Luck of Barry Lyndon by William Makepeace Thackeray, the 1974 film Barry Lyndon recounts the story of a Scottish man in 18th century Europe named Redmond Barry, who, through duels won and lost, through battles fought under the British and Prussian army, through friends gained and enemies made, came to acquire the name and title of Barry Lyndon. Much like its slow pacing, Stanley Kubrick's Barry Lyndon gradually attained to its deserving reputation only after opening to mixed reviews and modest commercial success in its original 1975 theatrical release. Through the decades that followed, critics and audiences alike came to the realization that Barry Lyndon was apt to entrance and cast a spell during a deliberate and methodical three-hour runtime. Performances that provoke thought and a script that utilizes impactful dialogue yet chooses to display it sparingly gives the rise and fall of Redmond Barry's story the life and magic breathing throughout the picture. Sir, let those laugh that win. Barry Lyndon's directing and cinematography are the two vital most aspects that facilitate the precise strokes of a brush handled by Stanley Kubrick and John Alcott that blend Barry Lyndon's overarching painting with depth, clarity, and beauty. Although John Alcott is credited, and rightly so, and received an Academy Award for Barry Lyndon cinematography, for the sake of this analysis, when discussing the choices that ultimately led to Barry Lyndon's beautiful guise and composition, I will be accrediting both Stanley Kubrick and John Alcott. The reason for this being that Stanley Kubrick, although the director, is famously known for having a further reach into the inner workings of other aspects on a film's production than most directors are known for. It is well to dream of glorious war in a snug armchair at home, but it is a very different thing to see it first hand. And after the death of his friend, Barry's thoughts turned from those of military glory to those of finding a way to escape the service to which he was now tied for another six years. Here was the opportunity to escape from the army for which he had been searching. This officer's uniform and papers should allow him to travel without suspicion and stay ahead of the news of his desertion, which would be sure to follow. Shall have precious little time together. You'll terribly cross with me. Damn you. Damn you. You know I can't stay cross with you for long. Oh, Jonathan. It's times like this that I realize how much I care for you and how... Impossibly empty life would be without you. Frederick. Mainly because he was an artur that would stop at nothing to achieve his vision. Kubrick's meticulous approach allows Barry Lyndon to take influence and share a similar sentiment with the major art movements of 18th century Europe. Particularly the cinematography tends to pay homage and take visual notes. Kubrick and Alcott work together to craft Barry Lyndon's avant-garde cinematography through key technical decisions and stylistic camera work employed to benefit Barry Lyndon's narrative. The whole film is characterized by soft visuals and enveloped with a muted palette that exudes an atmosphere like the Rococo period that was defined by soft colors of neoclassicism, symmetry, and romanticism, emotion, and nature. Alcott captured Barry Lyndon on Eastman 100T5254 film stock that was central in achieving the base visual style of 18th century paintings that Kubrick was incisive on because of its creamy neutral tones that pick up less red flesh tones and less contrast, providing a pastel appearance. And to capture a world before artificial lighting, Kubrick insisted on working with natural light for depth and authenticity purposes. Shooting with minimal light made Kubrick have to push the film to get a proper exposure, further adding to the grain and softness, but a soft palette was exactly what Kubrick was behind. 
Now, using natural light for daytime interior and exterior shots brought its complications, but was reasonably achievable. What proved to be, in many ways, a historical feature of Kubrick's vision that took Barry Lennon's cinematography and cinematography as an art form a step further was the decision to have scenes lit entirely by candlelight. What proved to be taxing about this was it seemed like it was entirely an impossibility with standard lenses and film stocks of the time because there was no possible way for any camera to capture enough light. Luckily, in the 1960s, NASA commissioned Carl Zeiss to develop a set of large aperture lenses and having this larger aperture allows for um, a camera to take in more light and NASA planned to use this to capture pictures of the moon on its Apollo missions. What was eventually created were 10 Carl Zeiss F 0.7 lenses that were more than two stops faster than any high-speed lens at the time. Out of the ten, six were sold to NASA, one was kept by Carl Zeiss, and the last three were sold to Stanley Kubrick. Modified onto Kubrick's personal 35mm Mitchell BNC camera, the Zeiss F.07 lenses allowed John Alcott to photograph some of the film's most beautiful scenes. Importantly, Kubrick and Alcott seemed to put a significant sum of thought and labor into the camera's placement and in what way and where it travels, complementing emotional intensity. The camera is locked down on a tripod for most of Barry Lyndon. The only time this isn't true occurs during close, violent, and intense situations. Establishing that the camera should always be stable emulates a feeling of disorder when that notion is rejected, allowing a character's given emotion, in this case, disorder, easier to read and connect profoundly with the audience. What's particularly enthralling about Barry Lyndon's cinematography is how it takes the concept of the picture's unreliable narrator and frames many sequences like grandiose paintings. Oh my god. If you look at these pieces of art, there are similar compositional motifs that Kubrick and Alcott construct to pay homage to paintings of the period, but also notably to give people a viewing experience comparable to viewing an actual painting. A disciple of Alessandro Allori. It's dated 1605 and shows the adoration of the Major. It's beautiful. Yes. I love the use of the color blue by the artist. Yes, indeed, that is very beautiful. This let viewers be skeptics themselves instead of dumbing things down and allowing the audience to blindly follow whatever the narrator says. This feeling is also used with the slow zoom outs matched with almost frozen character movement that turns watching a film into reading a painting. The lesson that should be gained from Barry Lyndon is just how necessary and important cinematography should be used to divulge a story instead of a hollow gimmick to make things look pretty. Thank you for watching. I'm Christopher Clark. I hope you enjoyed.